So we're going to start a new series here. We're going to read this morning. You can remain standing for the reading of God's Word from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 4. Uh, we're going to read this a lot over the next coming weeks because there's a lot here about the family. God's Word says this, wives and mix to your husbands as to the Lord because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives have to submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and his wife to respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up with the training and instruction of the Lord. People of God, this is the word of God. You may be seated. There's a little outline in your bulletins that uh, you can pull out and I'll help you. I, I love the uh, bulletin cover that uh, Amanda made for this series. That beautiful family up there in the front. Matter of fact, it prompted me after she put that up there that I should add a sermon uh, to this series called Building Up Strong Dogs. She didn't think that was a good idea either. But I do like the dogs that she put on the front there. And uh, I would have vetoed it if it had a cat on it. All the cat people, you come to our house, we get a cat. I walked in the closet this morning, it's a good feeling. My wife let her out later, don't worry. So, getting married in 1982, my uh, wife and I, we participated in what God has been doing since Adam and Eve, a man and a woman coming together in marriage. This is family were committed to each other to love, to love like Jesus. Then in 1985, right here, at Pella Hospital, we had our first son. And holding him for the first time was one of the most exhilarating moments of my life. I understood the biology of what it took to make this baby, but make no mistake, this baby was a miracle. He had come from God. He was on loan from God, and to raise him to give back to God. Simple as that. We were a growing family. We were raising our kids to love Jesus, and that was our mission. Patty and I have always been in the church. Patty grew up in one, and so did I. We have always been surrounded by good, imperfect people who were committed to building up the family. For any of you who've raised kids in this in our midst here this morning, know this that there comes a time in your parenting when you as parents become idiots. Do I hear an amen? Amen, yeah. And if kids are sitting here, you can say amen too. The amazing thing about this is is when you enter into that idiot phase as parents, your kids when they're in and around the church, there are going to be other people, maybe it's connected to a youth group or something else, but they're going to tell your kids exactly the same thing as you did. They're going to come home and share that with you. And the people who told them are the geniuses, not you. And that's okay. That's okay. That's why we're in this together as a church family. We're committed to each other. We pray for each other. And we help each other. That's why whenever we have a baptism here, we have the congregation stand because parents aren't expected to be lone rangers in this process of raising kids. 
And so sometimes, at least in every church I've ever been in, including my own family growing up, sometimes our house is burning down. You know what I mean. It's burning down. There's something going wrong. And it's oftentimes at that point that parents would say something like this. It's none of anybody else's business. I hope you don't say that. See, when someone's home is figuratively burning down, perhaps it's because a marriage is burning. Maybe it's something to do with your children. That's at the time that we most need each other. That's one of the reasons that we're the church. It's one of the reasons we, in our context, call ourselves a, a covenant family. So, let me say this about our family. Because as we begin this series, um, we're all human, isn't it? Our three, three boys, Bob, Tim, and Charlie, have all made professors of faith. All three of them were incredibly involved all their growing up years in church and in the youth group and even into college, leadership, worship, etc. Our middle son is raising with his wife our two grand boys to love Jesus. And the church and Jesus are at the center of their universe. Our oldest and youngest are great guys and great wives. But Jesus and his church are not the center of their universe at this time. So Patty and I throw in the towel. You know that at all. We believe that they belong, and there will come that day when they are back where they're supposed to be, where they belong. Until that time, we will pray, we will prod, we will have others do the same, including you. We believe that God will be faithful. And I know that every one of you has a story, too. And a part of your stories of your family aren't always filled with complete joy, but there's pain involved in there. And it's good for us to talk about those things. So I just told you ours. I hope you will tell yours to others. So I say to the people here that are single or older, or even people who might be in our midst who never had children, please celebrate this series and don't say, oh, family, that is so inapplicable to me. See, we as a church must celebrate family together. Why? Because family is the cornerstone of society. That's God's plan. It starts right away in Genesis. And in case you haven't noticed, the family for many years has been under siege. What are some of the trends going on in the family right now? This is 2020. Last year we did a series called Generations, with which we basically started in the 1920s, went all the way up to the present, and we told the stories of different generations, how different generations look at things, handle things, what their families were like growing up. And we saw that there was a wide difference between family kids that grew up in the 20s and the 30s and those that grew up in 2005, let alone 2015. We can't always say that one generation is right and the other generation is wrong, but we can say this. There's a lot going on that's different. So some of the trends that are going on out there in families right now is we have a lot of kid-centered homes. See, kid-centered homes against God-centered homes. See, around 1980, parents became more nurturing than past generations. Opportunity and advantage became the foundation and priority for parenting. We want our children to have every possible opportunity and shot at success. One pastor said this, when does giving your kid every advantage become a disadvantage? A God-centered home versus a kid-centered home. See, what happens is, is kid-centered parents tend to be guilt prone And I'm doing everything I can to give them their best shot. Sports, scholarships, etc. I remember I started teaching in the 80s, and I had good friends that were coaches, varsity coaches of, uh, of the high school. And boy, were they under pressure because parents sometimes would have perceptions of their children which weren't accurate. Is that right, Gary Nichols? Very right, right. 
So if the coaches didn't play the kids as much as the parents thought they would, those coaches were single-handedly denying them the potential for scholarships one day. I saw good people give up in coaching positions because they just didn't want to deal with that anymore. Kids-centered parents. Kids-centered parents are permissive. Some parents set no rules or guidelines. Sometimes that's a reaction to the strict parents that they had who were so dominant when they grew up. Others set boundaries, but they never really enforced them. The motives for permissiveness range from fear of hurting the child emotionally to the desire to be the best friend with your child. I would remind my kids as they were growing up, I love you, I love you, I love you, but there were times that uh, I had to tell them I'm not here to be your friend. I am here to be your parent. And sometimes being a parent is unpopular. Just that our parents lack rhythm and margin. It's normally full steam ahead every day. It's crazy all the time. I remember kids coming into school and their lives were nuts. They were nuts. They were in so many things. How could they possibly get their homework done? They're in this, they're in that, they're in the other thing. And I often wonder, is this because you want this or because your parents want this? There's a lack of rhythm and margin. Somehow just having some open space in the schedule didn't seem like that was normal. We might be missing an opportunity. See, kid parents, centered parents misunderstand the parent child bond. See, the bond between husband and wife is stronger than that of parent and child. After all, the Bible says a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. You see that bond? That's between husband and wife. With kids, Listen to this. We're actually preparing them to leave. Okay, according to the Bible, to leave. They'll leave. And they'll go become one flesh with someone else. Look, we told our kids when they were growing up, at times we couldn't wait for them to leave. They were sucking all the money out of our pockets. Don't misunderstand me. We love them very much. Well, sometimes they would say, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when we leave? I said, we're getting nearly past Disneyland and we're going to get a pool. We did both of those things and now we're in power. Oh, so, well. We love power too. There's no pool, no Disneyland. Another trend that's going on in, uh, with parenting and families is this prolonged adolescence. Adolescents. You know, there, there used to be just two periods or two seasons to life. There was childhood and there was adulthood. Okay, that's simple. Childhood and adulthood. And then in about 1904, the word adolescence entered the vocabulary. And what adolescence was is it, it, it created this gap between childhood and adulthood. And initially, when adolescence came into being, it was a short period, but now that period called adolescence has grown. So at the low end of adolescence, it's about 10, age 10. At the high end of adolescence, it's the low 20s. Somebody said, I got married when I was 18. Well, I hope you weren't an adolescent. See, people become adults in different places. You know that. But this adolescence has grown a significant amount over the years. Some would say that there has been too much privilege and not enough responsibility. See, the first 10 years of a child's life are something like this. Go, 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 go. We want our kids even in accelerated reading. Because if they're in accelerated reading, there's a better chance that they'll succeed in life, right? Accelerated everything. Kids often start organized sports. Organized sports at ages six or seven is they're going to become world athletes. 
Then our kids go into this stage where they start becoming little adults. And then parents begin to pull back on the reins. So for the first 10 years, it's go, 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 go. And then when they start looking like adults, dressing like adults, wanting to date like adults, do all these things like adults, then parents say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You see how that sounds a confusing message? Another trend is delayed marriage. Typically, there are five adulthood milestones that every generation experiences. Leave home, finish school or training, whatever that looks like, secure employment, get married, start a family. Okay? Leave home, finish school or training, secure employment, get married, start a family. Now, for generations, all of that happened in a very short period of time. That's just what was done. The independence delay says that you need to learn how to live on your own before you will be successful in marriage. See, that's the new trend. You need to learn how to live on your own before you'll be successful in marriage. Independence can often sound like selfishness. We raise our kids in a kid-centered home. We tell them to live independently before getting married. And then independent people get married, and guess what they have trouble with? They want to have their own way. Independent means independent, and they want to have their own way. They're a lot of trouble. Sometimes that would be a little confusing to Another trend that's going on is which is sliding versus deciding. Cohabitation has become all too often the normative behavior before marriage. What is the definition of this? Let's see how this works before we make a commitment. A few days, let's sleep together. Let's try this. We've forgotten what the word commitment means. See, commitment is really making a choice to give up all other choices. That's a commitment. When you get married, you say, I'm going to be committed to you, and I'm going to put aside all others, because it's you I'm committed to. But that's faith. And in some places, it's faith completely. It's faith so much in our society that's even invaded the church. Another trend, dating while divorcing. A couple you love, steered on, separated. Within weeks, there is a post on Facebook with their new companion. They want the support of their family and friends. It's painful and difficult. We can't and shouldn't celebrate a relationship while we grieve the death of a marriage. And so if you're divorced or remarried, my point is not to put you on a good thing. Assess where you are. Think of the community around you and move into healthy relationships appropriately. And then another trend of which I found to be very disturbing, gray divorce. For the first time in history, Americans 50 and older are divorced more than they are widowed. The divorce rate in people over 50 has doubled since 1990. So what are we going to do? With Jesus Christ as our source of all the strength, we're going to spend the next few weeks on what it means to build strong families, strong marriages, strong husbands and fathers, strong wives and mothers, strong boys and girls, and see the importance of Jesus being the center of all of this. And so because of Jesus, I'll profess to you, you profess to others, but I'm going to love my wife until death do us part. I will pursue my wife's heart, seek to bless her deeply. Husbands do that. Wives do that as well. We will honor our parents and forgive them if necessary. We want to encourage singles along the way, and we want to equip parents. So today we're starting with building strong families. Let me give you a few tools to focus on. 
from our tech supporting. And quite frankly, these tools apply whether you're a parent, and it even will apply if you're grandparents. And just so you know, I'll remind you of this a few times, and I'll have some other people up here speaking as well. But I'm not perfect at this point. I'm always striving at it. Building tools for a strong family. One of the first things you want to do is you want to have a joy-filled home. Isn't a joy-filled home wonderful? And you know what? A home can be filled with joy when the Holy Spirit is present. You know, prior to the text that we read this morning, just prior to it, Paul was talking about not being drunk with wine, but being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? See, joy doesn't come from drinking too much wine. Drunkenness follows, and then anything goes. But joy is going to come with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, our homes need to be joyful places, joy-filled places. Our homes need to be places of great laughter, places of fun, places where you find security because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Home, it's supposed to be joy-filled. And our homes can be filled also with thanksgiving. Someone once described the home as a place where we are treated the best but complain the most. How does a grateful heart promote harmony in the home? See, a grateful heart says things like this. I'm grateful for you. I'm so thankful for you. You bless me. I used to say this to my boys. Of all the sons, I, I still say this to Of all the sons of the world, how did I get so fortunate that I've been that one? You know what? You keep saying things like that to your kids, they start to believe it. And then one day, I get a card on Father's Day. Dad, of all the dads in the world, how did we get the best one? Now that touched my heart. But that's what happens when you nurture Thanksgiving in the home. You come with grateful hearts. And Thanksgiving becomes a part of the very fabric. So parents don't have to continue to hit their kids and they almost say thank you for that, say thank you for that, say thank you for that, say thank you for that. Because they learn it because everything about their home is about thanks and it's about gratitude. This is the mark of humility. We can all do this. And what you'll hear so many times during this series, it requires us to use our mouths. It requires us to say something like, I'm thankful for you, Margaret. I genuinely am. I'm grateful that you amongst all these people sit here every week. Aren't the chairs comfortable here? Yes, they are. She needs to invite you forward. I'm thankful for you. But you've got to say it. You say it to people. And then they believe it. You say, well, nobody ever said it to me. And I'm sorry about that. But the fact of the matter is this, is we're only going to change the trend if we start doing it ourselves. Expressing thanks continues to move me away from a complaining gleam. Sometimes churches are known for their complainers. The antidote to that is to just give thanks. I mean, everything isn't always right. Coffee isn't always as good as I like it, but I'm sure I'm grateful for it. Sometimes by the time I get out of church, all the chocolate chip cookies are gone. But I'm grateful that there's always cookies left. See, we choose what we want to do. See, the Bible calls us to give thanks for all things at all times, and this can transform a home. And then let's talk about something that's very key to every home, and that's love. Love. Love is the primary tool of nurturing. Josh McDowell, who's been an advocate for the family for many, many years, he came up with these points, and they're so good, I want to share them with you. But he talked about acceptance. Where there is true acceptance, people, children, feel secure. They know they are, they are valued and that they have worth. It doesn't depend on what they do. They have worth just because of who they are. See, that's how God deals with us. We don't have to do anything to, to prove or to get God's attention. God loves us just the way you are, and He loves us so much that He doesn't want us to stay there. He keeps moving us along. When acceptance becomes conditional based upon what our kids do, they pick up on that right away. So whether my kids got A's, B's, or C's, they're accepted. We love you. Win or lose the game, we accept you. We love you. 
And so if acceptance is the foundation of a good relationship with kids, appreciation is the cornerstone. Appreciation. Appreciation simply says this. You are significant. It raises a child's self-worth. Don't we want our kids to be able to say, hey, I'm important to my mom and dad. I'm significant. I'm a promise. They actually like to have me around. They're proud of me. So often parents need to have the goal of correcting, disciplining, and keeping children in line. Let's put that in the other direction. Look first where and when your kids, where and when we can sincerely give them praise, when we can compliment them and encourage them. And folks, we can do that every day. And it's amazing what happens is when we continue to compliment, when we praise, and we let them know that they are somebody, then when it comes time to correcting, it goes so much better. You know, I always look at it as depositing in my kids, depositing. I want to deposit. I want to deposit goodness into my kids. I want to remind them how important they are, how significant they are, how much I love them. And then there were times when I genuinely had to tell them, you are all right. You are all right. And that goes so much better because then when I withdraw, it's something to withdraw from. It never means you give up on discipline. Not at all. Sometimes parents feel like they were always on their kids' cases. In fact, take a look at your spouse and reflect. Okay, what do we need to do different? My wife is downstairs right now, but I can still say this. Once in a while, her husband would get a little bit negative towards his son. She would say things like, take a deep breath. Say something good. It'll be amazing how far it goes. And it was so true. And then there's this, folks. There's affection. Affection is important. And I know that we've got generations here that weren't always shown the affection that maybe they should have been shown. Because maybe their parents didn't receive the affection that they should have. But we have the opportunity to change this. Because affection says this. You are lovable. Children can't have too much affection. They need to hear and feel affection every day. You know, I don't have kids at home right now, but I have a bath at home. And this is an amazing thing. Some people find it easier to love a dog than their kids. True. I walk in the house every day, and that dog hears that garage door go off. I open the door, and that big old fat little choo-choo train comes to the door. Wagging its tail so hard it can knock down the cat. I like that. But what does that dog want? That dog wants affection. That dog wants me to hug it all over the place and then go and get a golf course and then we're all good. My kids did the same thing. What a beautiful thing when your kids say daddy's home. And what do they want? They want high fives, they want knuckles, they want whatever. Whatever age they're at, whatever appropriate affection it is at that age, they want that. And so what do we do? We physically hug them, we kiss them, we backslap, we do knuckles. In our home, we call them vitamin H, hugs, hugs, hugs. We give hugs. And we say this to them, I love you. We write them notes. We let them know that they are big stuff in our lives. What kid is going to want to see something tucked in their lunch bag? Or sitting in a place, maybe in the bathroom in the morning when they wake up. Those are investments that are so important to them. So yeah, when I dropped my kids off at school when they were freshmen in high school, I didn't give them a big smooch before they got out of the car. That would have mortified them. But I always told them I loved them. I always told them I was proud of them. And you know, folks, this never works in case you're following me. My kids know that I love them. Three square meals in the table every day. They know it. I want to hear the emphatic answer to that. Tell them to go. Tell them to go. 
I can't tell you how many funeral meetings I've had with people over the years where the kids are reflecting on their parents. Generally, it's their fathers that they're talking about. You know, we never heard it come out of their mouth, my dad's mouth, that I love them, but uh, we knew it. We knew it. I never hear confidence when they say that. There's not a person in the world that doesn't want to hear those words, I love you. Tell them. Show them. I never heard those words from my father to me, that I love you. And I've dealt with that, and I'm okay. I got to tell him that many times before he passed away. But if I die today, I know my boys have heard it from me. I know that my grand boys have heard it from me, and my grand um, and my daughters have also heard it from me. Please tell your kids that you love them. And then there's availability. Availability, taking time with your children develops their sense of importance. You know, when you spend time with people, they know that they're important. If you're, if, if you're not around, how do you communicate acceptance? How do you communicate affection? How do you communicate appreciation and importance? Parents often will say this, this is a way to salve their guilt when they're not spending time with their kids. Well, the time that I do spend with them is quality time. Well, just so you know, there is no, there's no substitute for quantity of time. See, in my life, Jesus has been my most important relationship. That's the way I was taught. Then comes my wife, and then comes my children. See, kids don't suffer when Jesus and their mother is the first object of affection or first people of affection for their father. But they do suffer when we put work before our children. They do suffer when we put the hobbies or other relationships ahead of them. We need to be available. I used to, uh, when, when, when cell phones came into being, and I always told my kids, you call me at any time, call me at any time. Well, Dad, what if you're busy? I said, I will answer the phone. So I was carrying my cell phone with me, and I was answering it. And so our code was, if I answered the phone and I said, are you dead? They would say, no, you can call me that day. But that was our goal. But I wanted to always be available to them no matter what, that I was always there for them. And then we need to have a submissive home. That's the last part of this that we read. We're going to talk about this more next week when we start talking about marriage. You know, in our passage today, Paul talks about building harmony in the home through submission. Submission is a word that people don't like. They don't like it. They don't like it, especially when they're the ones who are supposed to submit to somebody else. You know, Paul talks here about husbands and wives. And he talks about children and parents. Submission doesn't always have to do with the order of authority, but the operation of authority. How it is given and how it is received. See, remember when Jesus talked to his disciples, he says, you know, we're not going to throw our authoritative weight around like the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and whatnot. He said, not so with you. He said, I want you to be a servant. I want you to wash people's feet. Jesus taught us to use our authority to build other people up. Husbands, focus on outserving your wife. Parents, look for ways to use your authority to build up and encourage your kids. We don't have authority to make ourselves look important. We have it to make other people important and know that they matter. So parents, don't provoke your children. Use your authority to accept them, appreciate them, show affection to them, be available to them, and hold them accountable. And what? What? What happens? In a strong Christian home is where you will always pray for each other. And I want to encourage that from you. Whatever stage of life you're in, if it's just two people in the home, pray with each other. When you get together as family, pray with each other. Pray over your kids. Let them know who they are in God's eyes. Let's stand for